Hey, it's time for voiceover body shop tech talk. Tech talk, tech talk, tech talk, tech talk, tech talk, tech talk, tech talk. All right. This is tech talk number 112. I know there's 112 sitting up there somewhere. Just there we go. Just so in case you, know, you, you, you look at it and it's like, okay. We can always do a new, sh new show because Apple always has to release a new operating system to break everything. <laughs> there we go. So there's always something to talk about. Yeah, there's, there's another two years of stuff right there. <laughs> anyway, if you've got a question for us, throw it in the chat room, whether you're in Facebook Live or you're watching on YouTube or if you're watching on uh, LinkedIn. Now's the perfect time. If you've got a question about your home voiceover studio, some mm -hmm. piece of equipment, a problem you're having, a thought or two about having a home voiceover studio, throw it in the chat room right now. We'll get to it. So let's get ready. It's time for Voiceover Body Shop Tech Talk right now. VoiceOver Body Shop Tech Talk is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, the home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, the folks who bring you Source Connect, VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training, VoiceActor.com, your voiceover website ready in minutes, VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for voiceover success, and by World Voices, the industry association of freelance voice talent. And now, here's your hosts, Dan and George. Well, hello there. I'm Dan Leonard, as it says And right I'm there. George Whittem, as it says right there. And this no, is VoiceOver. George the Tech. Body Shop. <laughs> <laughs> George the Tech. <laughs> or VO. BS. BS. Tech Talk. Tech, tech talk. talk, talk, tech talk, tech talk, tech talk. All right. Tech talk. Lots to talk about tech, and uh, we've got lots of cool stuff. But but before we get into that, we have to remind you of something, and that is that this is what George and I do. Now I've seen a lot of stories and articles and people putting stuff in on on Facebook and LinkedIn and different mm -hmm. discussion groups. They seem to be parroting. Everything that you and I have been talking about for the past, well, 12 years doing this show, but before that, before we even started doing this. And we well, realized I mean, that's, that I'm glad. I, I, I would love to see people parroting what we're t talking about on this show because we've spent a long time making sure we're giving out the right info. So right. It's, a, it's a good thing. Um, but, you know, maybe getting it right from the source is probably a better, more reliable way to go. It makes sense to me. Uh, and this is what George and I do. We help you with your home voiceover studio. Talk about a niche market. Uh, but, you know, we help with podcasters, too, and stuff like that. But voiceover is our primary focus and how you get to sound the way you're supposed to sound, or what I like to say, what it's supposed to sound like, which is... Whistle. So, uh, if you'd like to work with me, all you got to do is go over to... There it is. Oh, homevoiceoverstudio.com. And uh, you'll be able to find uh, what it is that I do and how I do it. And my specimen collection cup, which is seems to be continuously flowing over with with all sorts of interesting samples. And it's always fun to respond to people and tell them what their audio is like. And if you want to work with George, who has a staff of thousands, uh, at least it seems that way now. you got a lot of people working with you. You've got lots of backup over yeah, at. We do. At over at George the dot tech. Um, yeah, I'm getting better at delegating things to other folks. Uh, as, uh, as I'm realizing I'm not the biggest expert in everything tech. There are people who are specialists and we have them all working with us, which is wonderful. Um, so we've got the best talent in the tech world of voiceover and beyond available for you at George the dot tech performer friendly techs and Dan. Oh. Yeah. What you doing over there at home studio? Home voiceover studio? I already told people about it. Oh, okay. You weren't paying attention. I was I was multitasking. I was reading <laughs> my notes for the next segment. Okay. Well, since you're now totally up to date on what you were going to talk about, it's time for George's weekly right tech that, update. <laughs> <laughs> what do we got this week? 
<laughs> oh boy. Well, first of all, we get it right out of the way. Apple Sonoma is out. Don't install it. What? Uh, yet. <laughs> <laughs> Every year. It's the same thing. Um, if you are jonesing to, make an, jonesing to make an upgrade, let's say you're on Big Sur or you're on uh, Monterey, this might be a good time to go to Ventura. That's fine. Um, I would recommend that before I, I click on the very tempting upgrade button that's in your, your, in your upgrade must window. Must push. Must oh, push it. so tempting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, just don't do it quite yet. We haven't had chances to test it out. Um, I did hear that Thomas at Twisted Wave did release an update patch to make sure he can support it, and he has. Uh, that's still not a good reason quite yet to just jump onto that. Um, and every year when the new OS comes out, that means old computers become unsupported or obsolete. I don't know the word. I think it's unsupported is what Apple calls them. So it turns out that folks on 2015 Macs, um, it doesn't mean your computer will stop working. It just means that your computer will not be able to get all the security updates and it won't be able to update to certain things like certain web browsers that are required to do certain things on the internet. And unfortunately, that's the way tech goes. Um, things do become outmoded after a while. So that 2015, well, what do you do with a 2015 Mac that still runs perfectly? <sighs> well, it could be uh, as it could be like a server. It could be like a data server. You could use it to keep, you know, a lot of videos online to view Music. on your network. Yeah, you know, there's a lot you could do with it. You could uh, give it to a school who needs a computer for teaching video editing. Um, it doesn't need to be used for web browsing. So there are things you could do, um, but that is what happens. Now, now this next yeah. thing on on noise floor. This is something that we talk about all the time, and usually. When we get a, we get audio from somebody, it's like, what's the noise floor? And there's so many different answers to how do you measure it, what is it, and yeah. stuff. So talk to this, us about this it. This came up, this got inspired from a specific Facebook post. And the post wasn't about, hey, how do I measure noise floor? The post was, what is a good noise floor? And I will never answer that question with a straight-up number because it ain't that straight up. It's not that simple. And, well, here's why. George the Tech. It's time that I did this. It was time to do this 10 years ago and finally doing it. And this is a little video explaining what I believe and based on my compadres in this business believe is the appropriate and accurate way to measure noise floor, right? How loud is the noise in your recording during the room tone of your files? So there's a couple reasons why this is not a straightforward answer, right? First of all, we're measuring dynamic range. We're not measuring just how loud the noise is, right? I could take the file you see on the screen right now. I could set the peak level of this file to minus 20. And when I check the noise floor by hitting play, by the way, the number you want to look at is an RMS level, not peak level for noise. I can get an RMS of minus 85. Wow, that's fantastic, right? But that's not telling the whole story because the peak of the audio file is still well below zero dB. So to really accurately measure this, we have to first correct for those level variations and adjust our peak level by just simply normalizing the audio file to zero dB. Okay. Now what we've... By the way, that's a little bit of a debated topic as to what to calibrate the peak level to. I've heard some say do minus three. Um, but I think to be as honest as possible, zero is the maximum level you can have. So that's why I said normalized to zero. By the way, that's normalized to zero peak. Somebody saw the video normalized to zero dB RMS and wondered why it sounded like complete garbage. <laughs> peak is what we're setting it to. What we've done is we've taken the peak level in this file, set it to its maximum level is zero, and then if we measure the noise floor in this sample, we'll get a more honest answer. Minus 65, minus 66 RMS, okay? Now, if the meters in your DAW don't show RMS levels, only peak, you might need to use a different method. Now, in Twisted Wave, we have File Analyze, okay? Now, what the same thing featured is in uh, Adobe Audition, and it's called um, 
what do they call it? Analyze? No, it's not called Analyze. What's the Adobe Audition equivalent of this, Dan? Let's see. Let me go back well, in here. You look that up while I play this. Yeah. Analyze does is really, really useful. First of all, obviously it gives us a peak, telling us 0 dB was the peak. It gives us the loudness, units, full, scale. And by the way, this is integrated, which means it's measuring it over the average of the entire length of audio file. It's giving us the average RMS power, which is what is used by the audiobook industry to determine the correct levels for delivering files. And it's giving us another useful number, the minimum RMS power, which essentially is giving us the average level of the quietest portions of this audio, which in this case is about minus 69 dB. Again, a good number. Now, how long is that window? AKA the RMS window. Well, right now that's two, 2,000 milliseconds or two seconds. So over the course of two seconds of audio at any time, that's the average that you're getting at the minimum, which is a pretty fair and honest way to measure noise floor. Does that mean at some other point in the file, the noise floor doesn't go higher than that? It does. It means somewhere else in this file, there may be an increase in noise floor. So Another issue with measuring noise floor is how big is the window of time? And this is something nobody ever asks or tells you to do when measuring your noise floor, right? I can pick a one millisecond moment in time where my studio is incredibly quiet and give you an amazingly low number, but that's not really a real world number, right? So an RMS window of two seconds, I'd say a pretty fair way to go, longer, is more fair, but honestly, most systems don't let you measure longer than two full seconds. Okay. Now, next is the fact that there's two different levels in this audio file. You'll notice there's a lower level and there's a higher level. So, in the higher level, there's a higher energy level being projected into the mic. In the lower level, there's a more of a conversational volume level being sent into the mic. So which really is the correct noise floor? Well, if you're doing high energy performances, then the noise floor would be, be accurate to measure the noise floor during this selection here. So it's the volume of the voice with the noise floor afterward. But what about up until that point here, the first half of the file? Remember that normalizing part? Well, yes, exactly. What if we normalized this, so this section of audio is a peak of zero, and we do another analysis on this selection. Now what do we get? Now we get a minimum RMS power, noise floor level, of minus nearly 60 dB, right? I'm hearing reports that the audio on the playback is bad. Is it un un unintelligible or just really bad? It's something? just a little choppy, that's all. Oh, it's choppy. Ah. Fascinating. Or chappy. Yeah, no, it's, yeah. But, but when we, well, we re-release this, we'll put this full video back in there. So we'll, no one will see any of this. Good one in. Yeah. Yeah, I had no idea that it was choppy. <laughs> Can't tell on this side. It sounds great. Um, so, yeah, I don't want to keep playing a video that sounds choppy. But the kind of the takeaway of this whole thing, really, is that um, audio quality or, or noise floor is a little bit more nuanced. There's more to it than meets the eye. And another thing I didn't get to address is that it, noise isn't noise isn't noise. You can have a meter that shows minus 60 RMS that where the noise is actually very prominent because it could be a buzz, a hum, a whistle, but that's still meters below minus 60 and be quite audible. And vice versa, you can have a metering that looks at minor, that's at minus 40 and looks pretty awful on the waveform because it's full of rumbling stuff but still to the ear sounds pretty good sounds pretty clean right so it's not as straightforward as as you would like it to be so when somebody throws these numbers around just take it with a grain of salt and remember that there is more to it than uh, than what you might think a um, couple more things that we can jump on before we get to the rest of the show um, i wanted to mention that um there's a, there's a little this just came up as well. USB audio interfaces with loopback. There are a lot of them now, and there's more coming every day, including the new Scarlett 2i2. 
the Gen 4 has loopback. The thing is, there's not loopback isn't loopback. Just like room tone isn't room tone, it depends. Loopback, there's really kind of two kinds. There's one kind that is playing back the playback to a separate set of channels, which they might call virtual channels. That's great if you're producing a podcast or producing something where you want to record the return to separate tracks, okay? Where that's not so useful is for voiceovers who want to do playback. If that playback is on a separate set of channels, chances are the software you're using for your meeting isn't going to hear that audio because it's on separate channels. Now, interestingly, Zoom now lets you choose multiple channels so Zoom would probably actually work. You could say, use channel one, my mic, and channel three, the playback, right? Um, that's a workaround. But not every program is going to do that. Probably not Google Meet. Probably not, uh, what's the other one, Microsoft Teams, you know, things like this, right? So keep that in mind. Loopback is different. The ones that have the right kind of loopback are the Steinberg UR12, the Yamaha AG03, and AG06. Those actually provide the kind of loopback that you want, um, actually, the Roadcaster Pro does as well. And the coming in someday in the near future or longer future, the Passport VO from Centrance also will have the right kind. The wrong kind of loopback is in the 2i2, the Evo 3, um, the SSL 2, unfortunately, because they're for different purposes. Um, another quick thing, when you're sending out, this is a PSA, when you're sending out audio to another producer or an engineer to finish a project for you, Let's say it's an audio book, something really long form. It's really, really, really important to make sure the audio you're providing is good enough to work with. What do I mean by that? You might record with the same mic, the same booth. Everything's the same, 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 same. You know how it sounds. What can change? Your own voice. <laughs> if, you, <laughs> if it's allergy season and you're on allergy meds and you know that that's messing with the sound of your voice, and if you don't know, you should know that. Probably is. Um, absolutely make sure that those files are checked and listened to if you don't trust yourself by somebody else at least um, before you go and record an entire book. You know, 8, 7, 12, 30 hours. <laughs> Do not record an entire book at once and send the files off. Record chapter by chapter. Make sure someone's checking those files. I'll tell you, not everything can be fixed in post. There are certain things that just cannot be reliably fixed in post. So don't yeah. be stuck in that yeah, position. we had a good time with that this week. Uh, <laughs> you we hear that amongst our our crowd, and it's like, well, should we do this? We should. My thought was, if it's throughout the entire thing, you know, if you can fix it in post, fine. Otherwise, it was a great rehearsal. That's right. Uh, so That's try right. try it again, but it was a pretty prominent nasal squeak it in was there. Quite a squeaky nasally thing. Yeah. Yeah. We don't normally hear that stuff because when we're talking to other people. They don't hear it either. It's just because you're close in on conversation. The mic. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. The mic, uh, when it's very close up, it's pointing into the nasal passage, and now it's picking up things <laughs> coming out of your. Yeah, it's coming out of your <laughs> nose. It's picking up all sorts of stuff coming out of your face. I like to say it's all of it. This, it's the sounds <laughs> coming out of your face, right? It's not just coming out of your mouth. It's coming out all over the place. Um, last one, real quick, because I want to get to Dan's thing. Um, watch out for those ill-informed client requests. This was a good one I saw today. I have a project requesting raw wave files recorded at bitrate 192 kilobits per second. What? Uh, the person who posted this said, I do not, however, see a way to choose a kilobits per second for wave format. I am only given the option of kilobits per second when I save it as an MP3. That's correct, right? Bitrate refers to how much data are you fitting into a certain amount of time? Kilobits per second. That's bit rate. Bit depth, which when we talk about 16-bit, 24-bit, is a whole different animal. Probably what they maybe wanted is they conflated some other numbers. Maybe they want 192 kilobit. No, they wanted, maybe they want 192 kilohertz sample rate wave. Yeah. Which would be redonkulous for a voiceover. I mean, Fill absolutely up your hard overkill. drive in two seconds. Yeah, it's just like it's four times the file size and absolutely no improvement in fidelity uh, whatsoever. So it's it, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to punt on that one if they don't know how to answer that question. But beware, bit rate is for MP3s. Bit depth, 16 bit, 44, 24 bit, 
is for WAV files. All right, right. Dan. Yeah. Sometimes you, you wonder, you know, where people pick up information from. I mean, there's voice actors get stuff from everywhere, and we it's a hear game all of those telephone. Stories. Remember? E- exactly. Exactly. Everybody. <laughs> you know, once a guy says, "Well, it's this," and you need Source Connect, and the next guy says, "Well, you need Snurskadoodle." <laughs> uh, I, I'm not exactly sure where that came from, but yeah, oh, it's, I got my no Schneinhauser microphone. What do you <laughs> think? <laughs> Your Schneinhauser? <laughs> yeah. Um, it's amazing how people want to show you how incredibly intelligent they are by throwing out lingo and terminology as opposed to what it is they're trying to say. So be careful with that. All right, in, in my basic basics, and it's sort of going back to what George was talking about with, with loopback and, and stuff like that, there are a lot of different interfaces out there. Uh, you know, and we generally try to recommend stuff that we think that somebody's going to be able to use properly. Uh, now, now, George, we've officially sort of stopped recommending the Apollo Twin for a number of reasons, because people buy it because they hear, oh, I can do all this stuff with it. And that's yeah, that that's now a doorstop, isn't it? Um, I mean, a lot of people still have a studio built around it, but it, I don't recommend it for most folks. Yeah. I Learning mean, curve is ridiculous. It causes confusion. It's not worth it for most people. Right. The, the idea being that what, the, what that particular unit does is it, it allows your, you know, your computer to become a whole workstation with lots of different tracks and, and d- adjusting things on the front end as you're recording and then you know, on the, ba- the way back out. The thing is, is 99% of the stuff that that thing does has nothing to do with voiceover. So we don't recommend people use something that is more sophisticated than you're capable of learning. You shouldn't have to spend a lot of time on a learning curve for something that isn't really all that necessary. Uh, now, there are other audio engineers saying, well, this is what I use, so you should use it too, because it's going to sound great if you use what I use, which unfortunately is simply not true. The more stuff you have, or as my brother used to say, the more stuff you have on a sailboat, the more stuff that can go wrong. Uh, and the same goes true with, with an Apollo Twin. But you know, when you're looking at buying an, an interface, you don't have to go hog wild. What does it have to do? It takes the analog sound that your microphone is sending to it, and it turns it into the ones and zeros that your computer understands. What's the difference between models? I think most of it has to do with the quality of the preamp inside the interface. For example, what did I do? With it? Oh, it's over right here. Somebody gave me this this week uh, because they said it doesn't work. Well, I plugged it right in and it just came back to life. No problem. So chances are they weren't using it right. This is all you really need. If it's got a good preamp, most of the analog to digital converters in these things are all pretty good. Where you run into problems with an interface is if you buy a cheap one. It's like buying a cheap USB microphone. It doesn't have a good preamp. And you have to, you need a, because voiceover is a very conversational thing, uh, you know, where we're just talking at the level that we talk to other people over a cup of coffee or something, preferably not in a noisy coffee shop, perhaps in your, in your kitchen. Uh, while, while a studio condenser mic is very sensitive, you still have to have a lot of gain. Now we're seeing with a lot of the manufacturers, they've all added a little bit more gain in some of their later uh, their later models, like the uh, the fifth generation uh, Focus Rights and uh, some of the other ones, Audient makes a, a really nice interface, and Yamaha and uh, uh, what's Nobody's the other one? taking with? away game. They're all adding more. They're game. adding game, which yeah. is a good thing. Here's the thing about game, though, and why you need to think about it. When most of this stuff, again, is not designed for doing voiceover it's designed for making music and music is inherently louder than the conversational tone of our voice unless you're you know uh what's her name the uh the singer the who's whispery adele. singer what no oh, no the opposite of adele yeah the opposite of adele <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, oh uh, oh um um sorry we can't remember her name right now yeah Somebody it'll like, it'll come to me in the middle of the night and i'll have to edit it in but you all know who I'm talking about. 
She's a great artist and her brother. Uh, anyway, when you're singing or you're playing a loud instrument, you don't need a lot of gain because the mic's going to pick it up because you're singing. So you don't have to give that much gain. If yes, you're Billie Eilish, thank you, Jeff. Billie Eilish, thank you so Sorry. much. Sorry, Billie. Yeah, that was... I know she watches the show, and I, <laughs> I feel I feel crushed. I, it was in there somewhere. See, I'm taking memory supplements. It's getting better, but you know. Uh, anyway, what were we talking about? Oh, we were talking about uh, gain. Is on... Gain is all is gain everything. Gain, gain is everything gain. with one of these things because the digital, the the analog to digital converters in these all do the same thing, and they one doesn't necessarily do it better than another one. But again, if you've got a good preamp, and the ones that we usually recommend, the Focusrite, Audient, uh, Yamaha, Steinberg, um, not necessarily Behringer, because Behringer is, a, is an interesting one. Um, I've heard the some other stuff is, is sometimes considered to be a good one for the money. Yeah, um, but, you know, for the most part, it's... Um, it's not a crapshoot if you buy something, like I always say about a microphone, over 150 to $200, that's going to be the case with, uh, with your particular uh, interface. Uh, oh, also in the SSL2 from, uh, uh, you know, from that SSL. particular manufacturer. People like that one, <laughs> yeah. too. What do you think on that before the we SSL, go to the break? Yeah, SSL is a great. I mean, the problem with most of this gear is it's still designed for different use cases from voiceover. So like you said, the loopback functions are used for producing. They're used for doing like multi-track production where you're recording playback from the computer or an interviewer uh, for a podcast, et cetera. That's not what we need. Um, and so there, there's things added in that seem helpful than they aren't. They add features we don't need. Um, they add user interfaces that are complexing to use. Complexing? Yeah. Too, too complex to use. Too complex to yeah. use. <laughs> yeah. Too complex. Um, like, or, or things that seem simple because they have a single knob, but actually are more difficult to use because they have only a single knob, right? So, yeah, we're, we're really picky about what we like because we just have seen what people have trouble with, and we want you to have a user experience that's reliable and easy. Right. So don't go hog wild on an interface because of all the stuff it does, because most of the stuff that it does has very little to do with what you do. Uh, let it do its job. And to me, everything is physical. You know, I mean, there's going to be, you know, different ideas about it. And uh, to me, it's like, if you got a quiet room, that's not reverberant, you use your microphone, right? Using proper mic technique, you'll notice there's never a plosive on this show because and I have no pop screen because, and you hear me like I'm in the same room with you. Use your mic right and set your levels right, which is now becoming a whole nother deal with some other technologies coming along. That's all you're required to do. And you don't want, we don't talk to other people through all these filters and all these plugins and all these things that we use. There are purposes for them and, you know, reducing potentially some noise and stuff like that. Like if you have a really bad nasal <laughs> squirting sound in there, uh, hopefully you can get it out. But you want to keep it as clean as possible. So you want to have a nice interface that has a nice preamp in it. But that's all you have to worry about. You don't want stuff with a lot of extra stuff in there. So don't don't listen to all these forums saying, yeah, this is what I use. Just because somebody uses it doesn't mean you have to. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break here, and we'll be right back with all of your questions, which you can still put into the chat room, and uh, we will answer those questions when we come back. So don't go away. VoiceOver Body Shop continues after this. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez, and you're enjoying Dan and George on the VoiceOver Body Shop. So this week, we asked our great sponsor, Harlan Hogan at VoiceOverEssentials.com, what do you want to tell your customers this week? Well, Harlan said, how about a free VO baseball cap with their embroidered VO voice bubble on the front and their voiceover essential slogan, as heard on TV, on the back? It tells everybody what you do. VoiceOverEssentials.com VO baseball caps are 100% cotton chino twill, garment washed, unstructured caps manufactured by Stylemaster and feature sewn eyelets, pre-curved visor, and metal-adjustable tri-glide buckle with leather adjusting strap. And guess what? 
They'll send one to the first 25 viewers who email their VoiceOver Essentials customer service head, Terry Lee at terry.lee at voiceoveressentials.com to get your VoiceOver Essentials VO baseball cap. Offer is only good in the continental U.S. Well, let's talk about Source Elements, the creators of Source Connect, the software that voice actors use to be recorded remotely by the biggest and best productions in the voiceover world, which is totally true. Um, if you want to get online with that and start learning how to use it, head over to source-elements.com and get your account set up. We definitely recommend starting off, and you can start with a demo, but here's the deal. If you start with a subscription, then you're going to get the full support that they can provide to you. They have a very high degree of support. It's an award-winning support that they provide. Actually, they won an award for it this year and for good reason. And you will get that support if you're a paying subscriber. Another reason to be a subscriber versus a buying a one-time shot license is it just happened to one of my clients. He lost his eye lock. Well, because he was on a subscription, they were able to transfer that subscription over to the new eye lock. It was no loss of license because it's a subscription. So that's another strong argument against the one-time buy license. Um, but anyway, that's Source Connect. Recommend it. Check it out. Learn it. Love it. And start making some money with it. We hope you do. And we'll be back with more questions right after this. Well, hey there. It's David H. Lawrence with VO Heroes. And wouldn't it be cool if there was a very simple tool, drag-and-drop tool, that would guarantee that the audio you need to upload to ACX or any other audiobook platform is perfectly set up in terms of the tech standards, the root mean square normalization, the peak normalization, the noise floor. Guess what? There is. And I want you to have it absolutely free. It's called Audio Cupcake. And you can find it at audiocupcake.com. I helped create this software. It was built to my specs and my standards for when I do audiobooks. And I know it's going to work for you. Now, it's only available for Macintosh. Uh, because you Windows users, you have the ability to use other tools that work for you. But in this case, you edit your final raw WAV file for a chapter, you drop it onto Audio Cupcake, and out comes the 192K mono MP3 file you can upload immediately. That's audiocupcake.com. Audiocupcake.com. I hope you love it. This is Bill Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Whittem. VOBS.TV. All right. Well, we got some great questions. And looking through some of these questions, they all seem to be geared towards me for some reason. I'm not exactly sure. It's usually it's your night. It's my night. Okay. Well, let's get into them. Uh, you get the first one here. All right. This one's from Mojalao. I'll go with Mahalo. I think that's a better <laughs> way to say that, actually. <laughs> Mahalo is spelled with some zeros and characters. Um, opinions on sitting versus standing voiceover delivery. Well, if you guys watched the first half of the show of the last few months, did you notice that I sat for the first and then stood for the second? I don't mm. know if you did, but if you did, if you I, did, I did because you told me. Oh, but I'm going to think I'm going to stand up for the rest of the show. I've so. been doing it the last couple of shows. I do the I do the interview segment that we do the first week seated, and when I come in, when we do the tech talk, I've been standing. And I'm wondering if you guys have noticed any difference in my energy level, my delivery, or anything else. I'm curious. For that, my, Dan, uh, what are your opinions as an actual voiceover actor? You know, I, it's, it's changed o over the years because now I'm old. Uh, so sitting is, is, is a, always a preferable thing to me. I don't buy a lot of this stuff about, you know, you know standing and diaphragm support. I can see where that is really important if you're doing gaming. If you're doing uh, promo stuff where you really have to belt it out and stuff like that. But for the most part, look, I'm sitting here and, and this is how I talk to people. And this is the way my voice sounds, whether I'm standing up or not. And I, it, being conversational means relaxed. Standing generally tends to make people talk a little bit louder because they're concentrating on projecting and that's what they're doing when they're standing uh, and if you're, if, if you're doing an audio book or something like that, it's, you're going to be, you're going to be very tired at the end. So it takes energy to stand up, save your energy. To me, it's like sit, you know, or lean, 
just don't use yeah. a lot of the energy in your body to stand up straight. And, There's a uh, halfway point between that's right. sitting and standing. That's leaning. You can have a leaning stool. You can just have a tall bar stool and just, uh, you know, put part of your weight on it. That's a good halfway point. Yep. You know, um, and, but if you have a seat, it's got to be a comfortable seat. Mm -hmm. Like yep. my X chair here. It's yeah, very comfortable. That, that is a nice chair. Um, he had a part two. We won't get into a lot of detail in this because, you know, it's an extremely personal choice and uh, neither of us used both. <laughs> so <laughs> the question is pros and cons of using Logic Pro versus Adobe Audition. I will give my two cents. Logic doesn't have a great editing mode. I don't like the editing mode in Logic at all, whereas the uh, waveform editing mode in Adobe Audition works the way it's supposed to work. Like it works the way I want it to work. That would be a really big difference in between the two for me. Um, but that would be about it. Logic is cheap because you buy it once and you own it for life. But there's so many things in Logic that are not logical for voiceover. <laughs> so I just don't, I just don't find, I don't know. It just never, never feels right for me. Never felt right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The thing about Logic is, is that it's, it's the big brother to GarageBand which right. is designed for exactly what it's called for garage bands. Uh, yeah, it's music production. Yeah. It's, it's Composing. a, it's a multi-track program. Editing in it is, is very, very complicated and not as accurate as what you can do in, in uh, Adobe audition, which I use every day. Uh, logic okay. doesn't have a, a spectrogram in right, it. No it, spectrogram. it yep. It's uh, logic is made is really designed for making music. Audition was really designed for doing voiceover and adding voiceover to video. Right. So the workflow is there and it actually has several different workflows in it. I mean, if you go into mm -hmm. Adobe audition, you've got uh, you know, edit audio to video, radio production, there, you know, and there's a, there's a oh, yeah, know, there's advanced mixing, spaces for simple editing. You've got all of these different tools to work to create the right workflow for you. Yeah. And that's, that's why I like Adobe Audition. Yep. It was really, along with Twisted Wave, it was really designed to do what we do as voice actors. Mm -hmm. So if you want to be a geek about it, if you're like, oh, I want to have all this stuff, fine and dandy. Most of it has very little to do with voiceover as we right. were saying earlier. Justin Ramos has a question for me. He says, uh, how do you define signature sound? Is it the timbre of your voice or just the way you read copy or something else? Thanks. What is your signature sound? Your signature sound, from what I have learned over the many years I've been doing this, is the one you get booked for. <laughs> so that's your signature sound. <laughs> Uh, there are certain styles of copy, uh, that, you know, only certain people can do. Um, you know, if I said, what's my signature sound, I'm like, well, it depends on what I'm doing. You know, if I'm doing, if I'm doing a long format narration, there's my voice for doing that. If I'm doing a commercial, it's going to be a little bit different. And if you've got some range, you know, what is a signature sound? I think it's something that you don't have to concentrate on or think about. It's once you've been working for a while and what are you getting hired for? You can use that as your signature sound and the thing that you highlight in your demo. Uh, but I think it's, it's one of those pieces of terminology that, you know, some agents or some other people throw out there to say, okay, g b signature sound discuss. It doesn't necessarily mean anything. I mean, there's something specific they're talking about. But I think that's strictly for uh, commercial type reads mm -hmm. where there's a, you know, a much smaller cadre of people doing it as opposed to all of the other genres of work that, mm -hmm. are, that are out there. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. I think there's a signature sound occasionally with production. You, maybe you've been using the same mic for many years and you did use a processing chain on your voice so now yeah, it's kind of your voice is married to it and if you were to take that away then you would sound more muffled and raw or something something that didn't sell you as well so sometimes you get married to your signature sound and you re then you're required to have extra gadgets and things that you didn't normally have to have there i go popping the mic um so yeah watch out for getting hooked to a signature sound sometimes it can be an a bit of an albatross. 
Yeah. I mean, sometimes you you know you'll 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 book a gig and the client will say, "Well, I like the way you did this on your demo. Can you do that?" You know, anything that's on your demo is a signature sound to you and what they want. And a lot of times they'll say, Good, "Like the third cut on your demo." I'm like, okay, I'll go back and listen to the third cut. I'm like, what did they look? Oh, oh, okay, that read. Right. You know, so that's and that's why in a demo. And last week we had uh, Robbo and Andrew on. We were talking about demos. Uh, you know, it, you've it, it's got to be contrasting. You've got to have slightly different styles to the read. Uh, in order for people to say, well, you can do this. I don't know about that, but you clearly can do it in this type of copy or this type of yeah. spot. So. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You're welcome, Justin. No problem. Yeah. Uh, Keith Copeland, uh, this is regarding to the, my, the demo we did earlier showing right. um, measuring noise, noise floor. floor. Yeah. How do you do this in Audacity? Well, I guess what? There actually is a tool that is very similar to those tools. It's actually called the most bizarre name of all. ACX check. <laughs> that is the closest thing. Um, in analyze in the analyze menu of Audacity, you'll find ACX check. Um, let's see if what kind of a disaster I can create by trying to show you this. Let's go here. Now this is a great audio sample showing you the wrong way to set your levels. That is, that is the actual <laughs> level of the audio that was sent to me. So let's take a look. Let's go to uh, analyze. ACX check, boom. Oh, see, yeah, it doesn't show that because it's it's a window over top the window, so you don't get to see it because technology, yay. Uh, let's see if we can try that one other different way. Let's go to present, share screen. I guess I have to do entire screen, hey? Well, sometimes that works. Well, let's move things around so you don't have to see the entire production screen on my computer. Let's do this. Let's do that. Let's do this. Let's do that. Bingo, bango. And let's go to analyze ACX check. There we go. That looks familiar. So it's going to tell you things like passes ACX. You don't care about any of that. All you care about is um, certain values like peak level. Look at the peak level of this file. It's minus 34.5. Not that seeing is it. dramatically low. Oh, not you're seeing not seeing it. that now? I'm nope. seeing it. Sue, do you see it? Yes or no? What in the blazes? It's showing it on my screen in, in, the, in the share window. Stopping, sharing, entire screen, take three. <laughs> now do you see it? Uh, it's not showing up in the, uh, in the box there. It beats me, dude. This is why we're going to go to a different production software at some point in the near future because <laughs> this stuff drives me crazy. But anyway, ACX check will show you a window that looks a lot like those analyze tools. And Oh, that's right. In Adobe Audition, it's called Amplitude Statistics. Mm -hmm. In Twisted Wave, it's called Analyze. In Audacity, it's called ACX check. And that's going to give you a very similar readout. It's going to show you minimum noise or minimum volume in the file at your noise floor. It's going to show you peak. It's going to show you average volume, right? So... Try ACX check. If you don't have it in your version of Audacity, it's probably an old version, or you didn't install the ACX check free plugin that you can get from Audacity's website. Moving on. All right. Next question is from FiberJazz. Uh, does Source Connect just allow remote site the remote site to hear what I'm recording, give direction, and then send the files, or does the other studio actually do the recording? Or can it work the other way? Dan, what brand of chair are you using? I got an X chair. Uh, it seems to be really quiet when you move. Isn't that something? Uh, anyway, uh, Source Connect. You're the expert on Source Connect, and then we'll go back to the other thing there. Uh, the Source Connect. And send the files. Um, so Source Connect has got one main job, and that is to connect your audio from your studio to the other studio so they hear you in real time like you guys are hearing us tonight in real time that are watching us live, except Source Connect maintains the sound quality at a very high standard. It allows for higher bit rates, so it can do higher resolution audio. It will also replace dropouts in the audio um, that other systems cannot do. It does all that automatically. So there is no automatic recording and sending back of files. In fact, if you're being recorded on Source Connect, you don't have to 
um, play back anything because there's somebody else who's doing that. That's the job of the engineer who's running the Source Connect session. That's one of the beauties of being directed in, in a Source Connect session. You have, don't have to be the engineer. You just get to be the actor. Somebody else is dealing with playback and shuffling files around, comping together takes, you know, all this stuff. That's their job. They're getting paid to be the engineer. So that's, that's one reason why Source Connect sessions tend to have a higher budget because they can afford and pay, have, have, you know, a proper production team. Um, and it also means that you as the actor just get to be actor. What a treat. Just, just talk, you know, I mean, it's great. It, it, Source Connect is super. You just turn it on, you know, if, once it's all registered and all the, the passwords are memorized and stuff, you just go in there and, you know, two weeks ago I was working with, uh, with Robbo and, and Andrew and we did it by Source Connect. They were in Australia. Mm -hmm. And the demo just came out super, sounding super because I just talked, which is cool. Now, back to my chair. Uh, once, once upon a time, Mark Cashman showed me his chair in his studio, mm -hmm. which essentially converted into a chaise lounge. So he could close the door and make it look like he was working when in reality he's just lying back. So I, I wanted something similar and incredibly comfortable. Uh, my back's not the greatest. So th at that time of year... Uh, my birthday is in late December. My wife's birthday is early December and our anniversary is right after Thanksgiving. It's a really tough time of the year for gift giving. So, you know, no, we don't like to guess. I mean, I don't mind guessing, but you know, it's like, uh, our earrings, this, that, the other thing. My wife says, what do you want? I said, I would like a really good chair. Oh, look, X chair. This is a really nice chair. And as you can hear, it makes no noise. It's really comfortable. It's really adjustable. And it's not cheap. <laughs> so if you want a good chair, you're going to have to spend for it. All righty. Ellen Conkren asks, Gain, do you mean the gain on my interface doesn't have to be turned up all the way before the lights starting, start turning orange and red? Well... Okay, we've said this one a million times. Here's the key to using the VU meter, especially on a, on a focus right, because um, it's got that great halo meter around it. Always in the green, always in the yellow, getting into the orange, maybe flashing into the red uh, once in a while. That's, that's the way we, we gauge the right levels. If it's into the orange, it's loud enough. If it's just in the green, it's not loud enough. If you're in the green and the yellow, that suffices just fine. Uh, so, but that may require you turning the gain up a significant amount to get it to that. And the thing is, is it has to be those levels, whether you're talking softly or you're talking loud. So you want to have a setting for both your conversational voice and then a lower setting for when you're talking a little bit louder. Excellent. Yeah. Um, Keith Copeland, another question. So is the Apollo Twin Overkill kind of a similar thing to the Pro Tools as being overkill as far as voiceover is concerned? Bingo. Yeah. And my favorite is the voice actor who insists on using Pro Tools and the Apollo <laughs> Twin. <laughs> well, they're Which sort is, of built for each other. But. Uh, there's so much overlapping of functionality when you have an Apollo and you have Pro Tools because of the ability to have auxiliary sends and different mixes and real-time processing and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, it gets crazy. But yeah, I would say it's very much akin. Um, it's also akin in terms of like needing to be compatible, right? right? You can do an upgrade to your system and all of a sudden things just don't work at all. And I mean, then what do you do? dead in the water. Right. So um, Pro Tools is very sensitive. At least it always had been very sensitive to the version of OS you're running. Um, and the Apollo Twin, maybe a little bit lesser so. Um, and in fact, actually, I've got these are original Apollo Twins. I have two of them Ooh. on the desk here, all both from clients. These are these still work. Um, they're eight, ten, ten years old, maybe. Um, they still work. Um, but um, that's because they do keep them updated with software and drivers and firmware. And I haven't seen any of their stuff go obsolete yet, which is pretty amazing. Um, but uh, yes, it's always a problem. You got to be on the same versions. You got to be up to date. 
or not up to date and stay versions back to make sure that things still keep working. It's uh, all that mess. That's all the reasons why we we really don't recommend adding that complexity to your studio unless you have a really darn good reason to do it. Right. I, I generally, the way I generally refer to it when people ask me, well, should I have this? What about, I need to have all the sophisticated stuff. You don't need the control room for a nuclear reactor to run a hamster running in a wheel. Uh, here's, oh, yeah. Here's another yeah. one. Okay. Everybody's Let's come got up an with... opinion, right? There's some very good producers out there. I had a producer, somebody that I know, not, this was not, not without my knowledge, go to one of my client's studios, go into his studio, saw he had this certain preamp, and said, you know it sounds great, and go in there and mess with all the knobs on oh, his preamp. Oh, right? bad. <laughs> he thought it sounded great, right? My client, after the guy left, not to be rude, was like, this did not sound great. <laughs> it sounded awful. <clears throat> so just one person's opinion on settings, no matter how big shot they are and own a studio and produce and all this stuff, Still doesn't mean they know what the heck they're doing in your studio with your voice and your mic and your gear. Don't let anybody touch your stuff. Yeah. <laughs> every voice is different. Every room is different. And it's nobody else's business. As long as it sounds good coming out, that's all that matters. And you're getting and booked. Somebody, yeah, if you're booking, don't worry about it. Keep doing you know? it. Well, that was a bunch of good questions yeah, tonight. That's great. Okay. Makes for, for an easy show. Thanks, producers. That, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for adding to all that. Anyway, if you've got a question for us, you can write to us at any time at theguys at vobs.tv. And that will, you know, if, if you write a question to us, it gets first in the queue. You don't have to, like, you know, wait. You know, if you're watching the show and you have uh, a question, you put it in the chat room. Yeah, we'll get to it. If you write to us, it goes first in the queue because That's one right. will look at, we get to read it and go, hmm, how can we answer this? That's right. You might even give a little pre-thought. We might even do a video about it. You never that, know. You never know. So let's, let's go that way. Anyway, thank you for all your questions. We got a few things to talk about after uh, the break, so don't go away. We'll be right back with some important stuff. So uh, here's some more important stuff. This is Ariana Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Whittem. VOBS.TV. Your dynamic voiceover career requires extra resources to keep moving ahead. There's one place where you can explore everything the voiceover industry has to offer. That place is VoiceOverExtra.com. Whether you're just exploring a voiceover career or a seasoned veteran ready to reach that next professional level, stay in touch with market trends, coaching, products, and services while avoiding scams and other pitfalls. VoiceOver Extra has hundreds of articles, free resources, and training that will save you time and help you succeed. Learn from the most respected talents, coaches, and industry insiders when you join the online sessions, bringing you the most current information on topics like audiobooks, auditioning, home studio setup, and equipment, marketing, performance techniques, and much more. It's time to hit your one-stop daily resource for voiceover success. Sign up for a free subscription to newsletters and reports. It's all here at voiceoverextra.com. That's voiceoverxtra.com. You know, one thing's for sure. You have to have a, a website if you're a voice actor. It's your business card along with your demos and stuff like that. So if you have to have a website, which you absolutely have to do, and you don't have one yet, here's a real easy way to get yourself up and online like that. And that is to go to voiceactor.com, voiceactor.com. It's a subsidiary of voiceactorwebsites.com, but they've made it even easier by having a website that is full of templates. And the great thing about templates is they're just templates. They're like, okay, I can use all right this background. Oh, wait, I can change the background. I can change the color scheme of this sort of uh, this template. I can put in all my information. It says, okay, what's your name? What's your contact information? It has a way to put your demos in there. And you get it up and you get it up and running and on the Internet starting off for free. Uh, so you can get at least get the idea of what your website should look like. And then for $20 a month, 
you get your own URL and that's what you put on your business card. Hey, you want to listen to my demos? Here's my website. Or if somebody calls you and says, I can I hear your demos, just go to my website. And there they are. What should you have in your, in your website? Of course, perhaps your name, not necessarily your picture, unless you have a, you don't have a voice for radio, uh, and your demos and your contact information. That's all you need, but you want to have a pleasant background to it and all that stuff. And it's easy to navigate. That's the most important thing. So go over to voiceactor.com and get your website up and running like that. We are the World Voices Organization. Also, also known, known as, as Wovo. We're the not-for-profit industry association of freelance voice talent. VoiceOver is a complex entrepreneurial business. Wovo is there to promote the professional nature of voice work to the public, to those already established in their voiceover practice, and to those who want to pursue voiceover as a career. Membership benefits include a supportive and creative community, a profile and demos on voiceover.biz, our searchable directory of vetted professional voice talent, our exclusive demo player for your personal website. Our mentoring program, business resources, and our video library. Our annual WovoCon conference, a fun and educational weekend with other members with, with the, the chance, chance to learn, learn and, and network. network. Webinars and great speakers and weekly social chats with other members around the world. If your world is voiceover, make Wovo part of it. World Voices Organization. We, we speak, speak for those who speak, speak for a living. living. Hi, this is Bill Farmer, and you are watching Voice Over Body Shop. It's great. Take two. All righty. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight. Next week on this very show, we've got this guy, Dr. Dialect. Hey, PJ right Olchan will be joining us. He is a great coach. Uh, and we're going to talk about accents and the stuff that he teaches. And then uh, in two weeks, we've got another uh, great uh, another great guy coming on. It is Jeff. It is Jeff Howell, who is. Hey, a, right on. He is a, a great promo director and coach. And uh, he's, we're going to talk about promo. So we got lots of people coming up over before, as as we roll downhill to the end of 2023. Yep. And the season where my wife and I have to keep getting each other gifts. Um, anyway. <laughs> So make sure you're on for that, uh, and you're going to hear some great stuff from them. Uh, we have to, of course, plug what we do. Uh, if you want to oh, work okay. with me about your home studio, you go over to homevoiceoverstudio.com and have a riot just looking at that site with the Specimen Collection Cup and all that. And if you want to work with George, you go over to... GeorgeThe.Tech, and if you like deals, go to GeorgeThe.Tech slash VOBS. <laughs> and there are... Discounts on there right now. Discount code is uh, VOBS. Is it get ten? I don't know. If you go to the landing page, you'll you'll see the discount code. Yeah, there it VOBS is. fan Fans. ten yeah. gets you ten percent off any of the webinars content. We have a webinar coming up. Um, by the time you guys see this, it would be tomorrow. Um, I think on uh, Universal Audio Apollo. The thing that we were just telling you, don't get well. I can't get y'all to stop buying these things sometimes, so I'm gonna teach you how to get the most out of it. I'm doing an advanced yeah. Adobe. I'm doing an advanced course on Universal Audio Apollo, trying to get it to do everything voiceover people need it to do. That's coming up, and you can sign up at GeorgeThe.Tech/webinars and join in if you if you are one of those people that have invested and learned and want to know how to use it better. All right, you got some stuff, the other stuff piling up there too, oh. don't you? <laughs> <laughs> There's a few booths I'm I'm in charge of getting rid of for some companies. Um and if you're interested, I've got two Studio Bricks Pro booths, pretty big ones, and one vocalbooth.com diamond platinum series. That's the I think it's the five carat model. Um if you're interested, reach out. I've been putting these things on Facebook and it drives me nuts. I get a bunch of terrible fake ad fake offers to buy them and just i'll put them up somewhere uh, in the next week or two but for now just email me george at george the dot tech if you're interested in the booths that are, are all for sale these are all in the los angeles area so you'll be in charge of disassembling 
loading them out and driving them or having them move to your location. And then putting them together, which and is putting them back together. Which is like working with Lego. Mm. <laughs> Essentially. All righty. Who are our donors of the week? We've got Greg Cooper. Greg Newton. Uh, Grace Newton. Sorry. Grace Newton. Grace. Yeah, thank you, Greg. Uh, Christopher Apperson. Robert Leadham. Stephen Chandler. Casey Clack. Jonathan Grant. Thomas Pinto. Greg Thomas. And Dr. Voice. Antland Productions. Martha Kahn. 949 Designs. Sarah Borges. Philip Sapir. Brian Page. Rob Ryder. Shauna Pennington Baird. Don Griffith. Trey Mosley. Diana Birdsall. Maria Mackis. And Sandra Manwiller. You know, you can donate to the show and help us maintain the magnificent technological perfection that this show is every week. And every dollar helps never make it even better. <laughs> never, never, ever a, never glitch. a glitch. We'll figure that one out sooner or later. Uh, just go to our homepage uh, at uh, uh, vobs.tv mm -hmm. and you click on there. There's all sorts of things you can click on. But you, know, you can donate to the show and you can also subscribe to our newsletter uh, so you can know exactly who's going to be on. What's coming up. That's right. I uh, need to thank our sponsors like Harlan Hogan's VoiceOver Essentials. VoiceOver Extra, Source Elements, BioHeroes.com, VoiceActor.com, and WorldVoices.org, the Industry Association of Freelance Voice Talent. Join today because we got lots of cool stuff about to happen there. Uh, our thanks to uh, our wonderful staff. Jeff Holman uh, put up his IMDb because that's IMDb part of how he gets paid to do this. Yeah, uh, slash Jeff Holman with two Fs and, and one L and one M and one N. That's right. And put them in your next production. Uh, and great work in the chat room tonight, especially taking votes and mm -hmm. stuff like that last week. Uh, also, Sue Merlino for being our director and making it all happen from wherever it is that she is at any one particular time. But she can do it from wherever she is at any particular time. And, of course, Lee Penny for being Lee Penny. Well, that's going to do it for us this week. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for watching. Um, you know, again, voiceover is a very difficult business. There's a lot of people out there who say they're voice actors. Uh, but I've heard their audio, and maybe they can act, but their audio is not very good. It's a lot of moving parts. Folks. It, it is. Yeah, you gotta got to do everything right. But in the meantime, we've just come to the conclusion, if it sounds good. It is good. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver. Body Shop. Or VO. BS. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Tech Talk. Great eye movements. Anyway, have a great week, everybody. We'll see you next time here on VoiceOver Body Shop. PJ Old Jan next week. So we'll have a great time. Take care. Bye.